Section 9 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 9. Political Intrigue. Buena Vista. Movement against Veracruz. Siege and Capture of Veracruz. The Mexican War was a political war, and the administration conducting it desired to make party capital out of it. General Scott was at the head of the army and, being a soldier of acknowledged professional capacity, his claim to the command of the forces in the field was almost indisputable and does not seem to have been denied by President Polk or Marcy, his Secretary of War. Scott was a Whig, and the administration was democratic. General Scott was also known to have political aspirations, and nothing so popularizes a candidate for high civil positions as military victories. It would not do, therefore, to give him command of the Army of Conquest. The plans submitted by Scott for a campaign in Mexico were disapproved by the administration, and he replied, in a tone possibly a little disrespectful, to the effect that, if a soldier's plans were not to be supported by the administration, success could not be expected. This was on the 27th of May, 1846. Four days later, General Scott was notified that he need not go to Mexico. General Gaines was next in rank, but he was too old and feeble to take the field. Colonel Zachary Taylor, a brigadier general by brevet, was therefore left in command. He, too, was a Whig, but was not supposed to entertain any political ambitions, nor did he. But, after the fall of Monterey, his third battle and third complete victory, the Whig papers at home began to speak of him as the candidate of their party for the presidency. Something had to be done to neutralize his growing popularity. He could not be relieved from duty in the field where all his battles had been victories. The design would have been too transparent. It was finally decided to send General Scott to Mexico in chief command, and to authorize him to carry out his own original plan, that is, capture Vera Cruz and march upon the capital of the country. It was no doubt supposed that Scott's ambition would lead him to slaughter Taylor or destroy his chances for the presidency, and yet it was hoped that he would not make sufficient capital himself to secure the prize. The administration had indeed a most embarrassing problem to solve. It was engaged in a war of conquest which must be carried to a successful issue or the political object would be unattained. Yet all the capable officers of the requisite rank belonged to the opposition, and the man selected for his lack of political ambition had himself become a prominent candidate for the presidency. It was necessary to destroy his chances promptly. The problem was to do this without the loss of conquest, and without permitting another general of the same political party to acquire like popularity. The fact is, the administration of Mr. Polk made every preparation to disgrace Scott, or, to speak more correctly, to drive him to such desperation that he would disgrace himself. General Scott had opposed conquest by the way of the Rio Grande, Matamoros, and Saltillo from the first. 
now that he was in command of all of the forces in mexico he withdrew from taylor most of his regular troops and left him only enough volunteers as he thought to hold the line then in possession of the invading army indeed scott did not deem it important to hold anything beyond the rio grande and authorized taylor to fall back to that line if he chose general taylor protested against the depletion of his army and his subsequent movement upon buena vista would indicate that he did not share the views of his chief in regard to the unimportance of conquest beyond the rio grande scott had estimated the men and material that would be required to capture vera cruz and to march on the capital of the country two hundred and sixty miles in the interior he was promised all he asked and seemed to have not only the confidence of the president but his sincere good wishes the promises were all broken only about half the troops were furnished that had been pledged other war material was withheld and scott had scarcely started for mexico before the president undertook to supersede him by the appointment of senator thomas h benton as lieutenant-general this being refused by congress the president asked legislative authority to place a junior over a senior of the same grade with the view of appointing benton to the rank of major-general and then placing him in command of the army but congress failed to accede to this proposition as well and scott remained in command but every general appointed to serve under him was politically opposed to the chief and several were personally hostile general scott reached brazo santiago or point isabel at the mouth of the rio grande late in december eighteen forty six and proceeded at once up the river to camargo where he had written general taylor to meet him taylor however had gone to or towards tampico for the purpose of establishing a post there he had started on this march before he was aware of general scott being in the country under these circumstances scott had to issue his orders designating the troops to be withdrawn from taylor without the personal consultation he had expected to hold with his subordinate general taylor's victory at buena vista february twenty second twenty third and twenty fourth eighteen forty seven with an army composed almost entirely of volunteers who had not been in battle before and over a vastly superior force numerically made his nomination for the presidency by the whigs a foregone conclusion he was nominated and elected in eighteen forty eight i believe that he sincerely regretted this turn in his fortunes preferring the peace afforded by a quiet life free from abuse to the honor of filling the highest office in the gift of any people the presidency of the united states when general scott assumed command of the army of invasion i was in the division of general david twiggs in taylor's command but under the new orders my regiment was transferred to the division of general william worth in which i served to the close of the war the troops withdrawn from taylor to form part of the forces to operate against vera cruz were assembled at the mouth of the rio grande preparatory to embarkation for their destination i found general worth a different man from any i had before served directly under he was nervous impatient and restless on the march or when important or responsible duty confronted him there was not the least reason for haste on the march for it was known that 
it would take weeks to assemble shipping enough at the point of our embarkation to carry the army but general worth moved his division with a rapidity that would have been commendable had he been going to the relief of a beleaguered garrison the length of the marches was regulated by the distance between places affording a supply of water for the troops and these distances were sometimes long and sometimes short general worth on one occasion at least after having made the full distance intended for the day and after the troops were in camp and preparing their food ordered tents struck and made the march that night which had been intended for the next day some commanders can move troops so as to get the maximum distance out of them without fatigue while others can wear them out in a few days without accomplishing so much general worth belonged to this latter class he enjoyed however a fine reputation for his fighting qualities and thus attached his officers and men to him the army lay in camp upon the sand beach in the neighborhood of the mouth of the rio grande for several weeks awaiting the arrival of transports to carry it to its new field of operations the transports were all sailing vessels the passage was a tedious one and many of the troops were on shipboard over thirty days from the embarkation at the mouth of the rio grande to the time of debarkation south of vera cruz the trip was a comfortless one for officers and men the transports used were built for carrying freight and possessed but limited accommodations for passengers and the climate added to the discomfort of all the transports with troops were assembled in the harbor of anton lazardo some sixteen miles south of vera cruz as they arrived and there awaited the remainder of the fleet bringing artillery ammunition and supplies of all kinds from the north with the fleet there was a little steam propeller dispatch boat the first vessel of the kind i had ever seen and probably the first of its kind ever seen by any one then with the army at that day ocean steamers were rare and what there were were side wheelers this little vessel going through the fleet so fast so noiselessly and with its propeller under water out of view attracted a great deal of attention i recollect that lieutenant sidney smith of the fourth infantry by whom i happened to be standing on the deck of a vessel when this propeller was passing exclaimed why the thing looks as if it was propelled by the forces of circumstances finally on the seventh of march eighteen forty seven the little army of ten or twelve thousand men given scott to invade a country with a population of seven or eight million a mountainous country affording the greatest possible natural advantages for defence was all assembled and ready to commence the perilous task of landing from vessels lying in the open sea the debarkation took place inside of the little island of sacrificio some three miles south of vera cruz the vessels could not get anywhere near shore so that everything had to be landed in lighters or surf boats general scott had provided these before leaving the north the breakers were sometimes high so that the landing was tedious the men were got ashore rapidly because they could wade when they came to shallow water but the camp and garrison equipage provisions ammunition and all stores had to be protected from the salt water and therefore their landing took several days 
the mexicans were very kind to us however and threw no obstacles in the way of our landing except an occasional shot from their nearest fort during the debarkation one shot took off the head of major albertus no other i believe reached anywhere near the same distance on the ninth of march the troops were landed and the investment of vera cruz from the gulf of mexico south of the city to the gulf again on the north was soon and easily effected the landing of stores was continued until everything was got ashore vera cruz at the time of which i write and up to eighteen eighty was a walled city the wall extended from the water's edge south of the town to the water again on the north there were fortifications at intervals along the line and at the angles in front of the city and on an island half a mile out in the gulf stands san juan de ulua an enclosed fortification of large dimensions and great strength for that period against artillery of the present day the land forts and walls would prove elements of weakness rather than strength after the invading army had established their camps out of range of the fire from the city batteries were established under cover of night far to the front of the line where the troops lay these batteries were entrenched and the approaches sufficiently protected if a sortie had been made at any time by the mexicans the men serving the batteries could have been quickly reinforced without great exposure to the fire from the enemy's main line no serious attempt was made to capture the batteries or to drive our troops away the siege continued with brisk firing on our side till the twenty seventh of march by which time a considerable breach had been made in the wall surrounding the city upon this general morales who was governor of both the city and of san juan de ulua commenced a correspondence with general scott looking to the surrender of the town forts and garrison on the twenty ninth vera cruz and san juan de ulua were occupied by scott's army about five thousand prisoners and four hundred pieces of artillery besides large amounts of small arms and ammunition fell into the hands of the victorious force the casualties on our side during the siege amounted to sixty-four officers and men killed and wounded end of section nine Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. And of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant, this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 10. March to Jalapa. Battle of Cerro Gordo. Perote. Puebla. Scott and Taylor. General Scott had less than twelve thousand men at vera cruz he had been promised by the administration a very much larger force or claimed that he had and he was a man of veracity twelve thousand was a very small army with which to penetrate two hundred and sixty miles into an enemy's country and to besiege the capital a city at that time of largely over one hundred thousand inhabitants then too any line of march that could be selected led through mountain passes easily defended 
In fact, there were at that time but two roads from Vera Cruz to the city of Mexico that could be taken by an army, one by Jalapa and Perote, the other by Cordoba and Arizaba, the two coming together on the great plain which extends to the city of Mexico after the range of mountains is passed. It was very important to get the army away from Vera Cruz as soon as possible, in order to avoid the yellow fever, or vomito, which usually visits that city early in the year, and is very fatal to persons not acclimated. But transportation, which was expected from the north, was arriving very slowly. It was absolutely necessary to have enough to supply the army to Jalapa, sixty-five miles in the interior and above the fevers of the coast. At that point the country is fertile, and an army of the size of General Scott's could subsist there for an indefinite period. Not counting the sick, the weak, and the garrisons for the captured city and fort, the moving column was now less than ten thousand strong. This force was composed of three divisions, under General Twiggs, Patterson, and Worth. The importance of escaping the vomito was so great that as soon as transportation enough could be got together to move a division, the advance was commenced. On the 8th of April, Twiggs's division started for Jalopa. He was followed very soon by Patterson with his division, General Worth was to bring up the rear with his command as soon as transportation enough was assembled to carry six days' rations for his troops, with the necessary ammunition and camp and garrison equipage. It was the 13th of April before this division left Veracruz. The leading division ran against the enemy at Cerro Gordo, some fifty miles west on the road to Jalapa, and went into camp at Plan del Rio, about three miles from the fortification. General Patterson reached Plan del Rio with his division soon after Twiggs arrived. The two were then secure against an attack from Santa Anna, who commanded the Mexican forces. At all events, they confronted the enemy without reinforcements and without molestation until the 18th of April. General Scott had remained at Veracruz to hasten preparations for the field, but on the 12th, learning the situation at the front, he hastened on to take personal supervision. He at once commenced his preparation for the capture of the position held by Santa Anna and of the troops holding it. Cerro Gordo is one of the higher spurs of the mountains, some twelve to fifteen miles east of Jalapa, and Santa Anna had selected this point as the easiest to defend against an invading army. The road, said to have been built by Cortez, zigzags around the mountainside and was defended at every turn by artillery. On either side were deep chasms or mountain walls. A direct attack along the road was an impossibility. A flank movement seemed equally impossible. After the arrival of the commanding general upon the scene, reconnaissance were sent out to find or to make a road by which the rear of the enemy's works might be reached without a front attack. These reconnaissances were made under the supervision of Captain Robert E. Lee, assisted by Lieutenants P. G. T. Beauregard, Isaac I. Stevens, Z. B. Tower, G. W. Smith, George B. McClellan, and J. G. Foster of the Corps of Engineers, all officers who attained rank and fame on one side or the other, in the great conflict for the preservation of the unity of the nation. The reconnaissance was completed, and the labor of cutting out and making roads by the flank of the enemy was effected by the 17th of the month. 
This was accomplished without the knowledge of Santa Anna or his army, and over ground where he supposed it impossible. On the same day, General Scott issued his order for the attack on the 18th. The attack was made as ordered, and perhaps there was not a battle of the Mexican War, or of any other, where orders issued before an engagement were nearer being a correct report of what afterwards took place. Under the supervision of the engineers, roadways had been opened over chasms to the right, where the walls were so steep that men could barely climb them. Animals could not. These had been opened under cover of night, without attracting the notice of the enemy. The engineers who had directed the opening led the way and the troops followed. Artillery was let down the steep slopes by hand. The men engaged attaching a strong rope to the rear axle and letting the guns down, a piece at a time, while the men at the ropes kept their ground on top paying out gradually, while a few at the front directed the course of the piece. In like manner, the guns were drawn by hand up the opposite slope. In this way, Scott's troops reached their assigned position in rear of most of the entrenchments of the enemy unobserved. The attack was made. The Mexican reserves behind the works beat a hasty retreat, and those occupying them surrendered. On the left, General Pillow's command made a formidable demonstration which doubtless held a part of the enemy in his front and contributed to the victory. I am not pretending to give full details of all the battles fought, but of the portion that I saw. There were troops engaged on both sides at other points in which both sustained losses, but the battle was won as here narrated. The surprise of the enemy was complete, the victory overwhelming. Some three thousand prisoners fell into Scott's hands, also a large amount of ordnance and ordnance stores. The prisoners were paroled, the artillery parked, and the small arms and ammunition destroyed. The Battle of Buena Vista was probably very important to the success of General Scott at Cerro Gordo, and in his entire campaign from Vera Cruz to the Great Plains reaching to the city of Mexico. The only army, Santa Ana, had to protect his capital and the mountain passes west of Vera Cruz was the one he had with him confronting General Taylor. It is not likely that he would have gone as far north as Monterey to attack the United States troops when he knew his country was threatened with invasion further south. When Taylor moved to Saltillo, and then advanced on to Buena Vista, Santa Anna crossed the desert confronting the invading army, hoping, no doubt, to crush it and get back in time to meet General Scott in the mountain passes west of Veracruz. His attack on Taylor was disastrous to the Mexican army, but notwithstanding this, he marched his army to Cerro Gordo, a distance not much short of 1,000 miles by the line he had to travel in time to entrench himself well before Scott got there. If he had been successful at Buena Vista, his troops would, no doubt, have made a more stubborn resistance at Cerro Gordo. Had the Battle of Buena Vista not been fought, Santa Anna would have had time to move leisurely to meet the invader further south and with an army not demoralized nor depleted by defeat. After the battle, the victorious army moved on to Jalapa, where it was in a beautiful, productive, and healthy country far above the fevers of the coast. Jalapa, however, is still in the mountains, and between there and the Great Plain, 
the whole line of the road is easy of defense it was important therefore to get possession of the great highway between the sea coast and the capital up to the point where it leaves the mountains before the enemy could have time to reorganize and fortify in our front worth's division was selected to go forward to secure this result the division marched to perotti on the great plain not far from where the road debouches from the mountains there is a low strong fort on the plain in front of the town known as the castle of perotti this however offered no resistance and fell into our hands with its armament general scott having now only nine or ten thousand men west of vera cruz and the time of some four thousand of them being about to expire a long delay was the consequence the troops were in a healthy climate and where they could subsist for an indefinite period even if their line back to vera cruz should be cut off it being ascertained that the men whose time would expire before the city of mexico could possibly fall into the hands of the american army would not remain beyond the term for which they had volunteered the commanding general determined to discharge them at once for a delay until the expiration of their time would have compelled them to pass through vera cruz during the season of the vomito this reduced scott's force in the field to about five thousand men early in may worth with his division left perote and marched on to puebla the roads were wide and the country open except through one pass in a spur of mountains coming up from the south through which the road runs notwithstanding this the small column was divided into two bodies moving a day apart nothing occurred on the march of special note except that while lying at the town of amazoque an easy day's march east of puebla a body of the enemy's cavalry two or three thousand strong was seen to our right not more than a mile away a battery or two with two or three infantry regiments was sent against them and they soon disappeared on the fifteenth of may we entered the city of puebla general worth was in command at puebla until the latter end of may when general scott arrived here as well as on the march up his restlessness particularly under responsibilities showed itself during his brief command he had the enemy hovering around near the city in vastly superior numbers to his own the brigade to which i was attached changed quarters three different times in about a week occupying at first quarters near the plaza in the heart of the city then at the western entrance then at the extreme east on one occasion general worth had the troops in line under arms all day with three days cooked rations in their haversacks he galloped from one command to another proclaiming the near proximity of santa anna with an army vastly superior to his own general scott arrived upon the scene the latter part of the month and nothing more was heard of santa anna and his myriads there were of course bodies of mounted mexicans hovering around to watch our movements and to pick up stragglers or small bodies of troops if they ventured too far out these always withdrew on the approach of any considerable number of our soldiers after the arrival of general scott i was sent as quartermaster with a large train of wagons back two days march at least to procure forage we had less than a thousand men as escorts and never thought of danger we procured full loads for our entire train at two plantations which could easily have furnished us much more 
there had been a great delay in obtaining the authority of congress for the raising of the troops asked for by the administration a bill was before the national legislature from early in the session of eighteen forty six eighteen forty seven authorizing the creation of ten additional regiments for the war to be attached to the regular army but it was the middle of february before it became a law appointments of commissioned officers had then to be made men had to be enlisted the regiments equipped and the whole transported to mexico it was august before general scott received reinforcement sufficient to warrant an advance his moving column not even now more than ten thousand strong was in four divisions commanded by generals twig worth pillow and quitman there was also a cavalry corps under general harney composed of detachments of the first second and third dragoons the advance commenced on the seventh of august with twiggs's division in front the remaining three divisions followed with an interval of a day between the marches were short to make concentration easier in case of attack i had now been in battle with the two leading commanders conducting armies in a foreign land the contrast between the two was very marked general taylor never wore uniform but dressed himself entirely for comfort he moved about the field in which he was operating to see through his own eyes the situation often he would be without staff officers and when he was accompanied by them there was no prescribed order in which they followed he was very much given to sit his horse sideways with both feet on one side particularly on the battlefield general scott was the reverse in all these particulars he always wore all the uniform prescribed or allowed by law when he inspected his lines word would be sent to all division and brigade commanders in advance notifying them of the hour when the commanding general might be expected this was done so that all the army might be under arms to salute their chief as he passed on these occasions he wore his dress uniform cocked hat aiguillettes sabre and spurs his staff proper besides all officers constructively on his staff engineers inspectors quartermasters etc that could be spared followed also in uniform and in prescribed order orders were prepared with great care and evidently with the view that they should be a history of what followed in their modes of expressing thought these two generals contrasted quite as strongly as in their other characteristics general scott was precise in language cultivated a style peculiarly his own was proud of his rhetoric not averse to speaking of himself often in the third person and he could bestow praise upon the person he was talking about without the least embarrassment taylor was not a conversationalist but on paper he could put his meaning so plainly that there could be no mistaking it he knew how to express what he wanted to say in the fewest well-chosen words but would not sacrifice meaning to the construction of high-sounding sentences but with their opposite characteristics both were great and successful soldiers both were true patriotic and upright in all their dealings both were pleasant to serve under taylor was pleasant to serve with scott saw more through the eyes of his staff officers than through his own his plans were deliberately prepared and fully expressed in orders taylor saw for himself and gave orders to meet the emergency without reference to how they would read in history End of section ten 
Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at jocclev.com. Seven of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 11. Advance on the City of Mexico. Battle of Contreras. Assault at Churubusco. Negotiations for peace. Battle of Molino del Rey. Storming of Chapultepec. San Cosme. Evacuation of the city. Halls of the Montezumas. The route followed by the army from Puebla to the city of Mexico was over Rio Frio Mountain, the road leading over which, at the highest point, is about 11,000 feet above tidewater. The pass through this mountain might have been easily defended, but it was not, and the advanced division reached the summit in three days after leaving Puebla. The city of Mexico lies west of Rio Frio Mountain, on a plain backed by another mountain six miles further west, with others still nearer on the north and south. Between the western base of Rio Frio and the city of Mexico, there are three lakes, Chalco and Xochimilco on the left, and Texcoco on the right, extending to the east end of the city of Mexico. Chalco and Texcoco are divided by a narrow strip of land over which the direct road to the city runs. So Chimilco is also to the left of the road, but at a considerable distance south of it, and is connected with Lake Chalco by a narrow channel. There is a high rocky mound, called El Penon, on the right of the road, springing up from the low flat ground dividing the lakes. This mound was strengthened by entrenchments at its base and summit, and rendered a direct attack impracticable. Scott's army was rapidly concentrated about Ayatla and other points near the eastern end of Lake Chalco. Reconnaissances were made up to within gunshot of El Panon, while engineers were seeking a route by the south side of Lake Chalco to flank the city and come upon it from the south and southwest. A way was found around the lake, and by the 18th of August, troops were in St. Augustine Tlalpam, a town about 11 miles due south from the plaza of the capital. Between St. Augustine Tlalpam and the city lie the hacienda of San Antonio and the village of Churubusco, and southwest of them is Contreras. All these points, except St. Augustine Tlalpam, were entrenched and strongly garrisoned. Contreras is situated on the side of a mountain near its base, where volcanic rocks are piled in great confusion reaching nearly to San Antonio. This made the approach to the city from the south very difficult. The brigade to which I was attached, Garlands, of Worth's division, was sent to confront San Antonio two or three miles from St. Augustine to Lalpam, on the road to Churubusco and the city of Mexico. The ground on which San Antonio stands is completely in the valley, and the surface of the land is only a little above the level of the lakes, and, except to the southwest, it was cut up by deep ditches filled with water. To the southwest is the Pedregal, the volcanic rock before spoken of, over which cavalry or artillery could not be passed, and infantry would make but poor progress if confronted by an enemy. From the position occupied by Garland's brigade, therefore, no movement could be made against the defenses of San Antonio except to the front. 
and by a narrow causeway over perfectly level ground every inch of which was commanded by the enemy's artillery and infantry if contre ross some three miles west and south should fall into our hands troops from there could move to the right flank of all the positions held by the enemy between us and the city under these circumstances general scott directed the holding of the front of the enemy without making an attack until further orders on the eighteenth of august the day of reaching san augustine to lalpam garland's brigade secured a position within easy range of the advanced entrenchments of san antonio but where his troops were protected by an artificial embankment that had been thrown up for some other purpose than defense general scott at once set his engineers reconnoitering the works about contreras and on the nineteenth movements were commenced to get troops into position from which an assault could be made upon the force occupying that place the pedregal on the north and northeast and the mountain on the south made the passage by either flank of the enemy's defenses difficult for their work stood exactly between those natural bulwarks but a road was completed during the day and night of the nineteenth and troops were got to the north and west of the enemy this affair like that of cerro gordo was an engagement in which the officers of the engineer corps won special distinction in fact in both cases tasks which seemed difficult at first sight were made easier for the troops that had to execute them than they would have been on an ordinary field the very strength of each of these positions was by the skill of the engineers converted into a defense for the assaulting parties while securing their positions for final attack all the troops with general scott in the valley of mexico except a part of the division of general equipment at san augustine tlalpam and the brigade of garland worst division at san antonio were engaged at the battle of contreras or were on their way in obedience to the orders of their chief to reinforce those who were engaged the assault was made on the morning of the twentieth and in less than half an hour from the sound of the advance the position was in our hands with many prisoners and large quantities of ordnance and other stores the brigade commanded by general riley was from its position the most conspicuous in the final assault but all did well volunteers and regulars from the point occupied by garland's brigade we could see the progress made at contreras and the movement of troops toward the flank and rear of the enemy opposing us the mexicans all the way back to the city could see the same thing and their conduct showed plainly that they did not enjoy the sight we moved out at once and found them gone from our immediate front clark's brigade of worth's division now moved west over the point of the pedregal and after having passed to the north sufficiently to clear san antonio turned east and got on the causeway leading to churubusco and the city of mexico when he approached churubusco his left under colonel hoffman attacked a tete point at that place and brought on an engagement about an hour after garland was ordered to advance directly along the causeway and got up in time to take part in the engagement san antonio was found evacuated the evacuation having probably taken place immediately upon the enemy seeing the stars and stripes waving over contreras the troops that had been engaged at contreras and even then on their way to that battlefield were moved by a causeway west of and parallel to the one by way of san antonio and churubusco 
it was expected by the commanding general that these troops would move north sufficiently far to flank the enemy out of his position at churubusco before turning east to reach the san antonio road but they did not succeed in this and churubusco proved to be about the severest battle fought in the valley of mexico general scott coming upon the battlefield about this juncture ordered two brigades under shields to move north and turn the right of the enemy this shields did but not without hard fighting and heavy loss the enemy finally gave way leaving in our hands prisoners artillery and small arms the balance of the causeway held by the enemy up to the very gates of the city fell in like manner i recollect at this place that some of the gunners who had stood their ground were deserters from general taylor's army on the rio grande both the strategy and tactics displayed by general scott in these various engagements of the twentieth of august eighteen forty seven were faultless as i look upon them now after the lapse of so many years as before stated the work of the engineer officers who made the reconnaissances and led the different commands to their destinations was so perfect that the chief was able to give his orders to his various subordinates with all the precision he could use on an ordinary march i mean up to the point from which the attack was to commence after that point is reached the enemy often induces a change of orders not before contemplated the enemy outside the city outnumbered our soldiery quite three to one but they had become so demoralized by the succession of defeats this day that the city of mexico could have been entered without much further bloodshed in fact captain philip kearney afterwards a general in the war of the rebellion rode with a squadron of cavalry to the very gates of the city and would no doubt have entered with his little force only at that point he was badly wounded as were several of his officers he had not heard the call for a halt general franklin pierce had joined the army in mexico at puebla a short time before the advance upon the capital commenced he had consequently not been in any of the engagements of the war up to the battle of contreras by an unfortunate fall of his horse on the afternoon of the nineteenth he was painfully injured the next day when his brigade with the other troops engaged on the same field was ordered against the flank and rear of the enemy guarding the different points of the road from san augustin to lalpam to the city general pierce attempted to accompany them he was not sufficiently recovered to do so and fainted this circumstance gave rise to exceedingly unfair and unjust criticism of him when he became a candidate for the presidency whatever general pierce's qualifications may have been for the presidency he was a gentleman and a man of courage i was not a supporter of him politically but i knew him more intimately than i did any other of the volunteer generals general scott abstained from entering the city at this time because mr nicholas p trist the commissioner on the part of the united states to negotiate a treaty of peace with mexico was with the army and either he or general scott thought probably both of them that a treaty would be more possible while the mexican government was in possession of the capital than if it was scattered and the capital in the hands of an invader be this as it may we did not enter at that time the army took up positions along the slopes of the mountains south of the city as far west as Tacubaya. 
negotiations were at once entered into with santa anna who was then practically the government and the immediate commander of all the troops engaged in defense of the country a truce was signed which denied to either party the right to strengthen its position or to receive reinforcements during the continuance of the armistice but authorized general scott to draw supplies for his army from the city in the meantime negotiations were commenced at once and were kept up vigorously between mr trist and the commissioners appointed on the part of mexico until the second of september at that time mr trist handed in his ultimatum texas was to be given up absolutely by mexico and new mexico and california ceded to the united states for a stipulated sum to be afterwards determined i do not suppose mr trist had any discretion whatever in regard to boundaries the war was one of conquest in the interest of an institution and the probabilities are that private instructions were for the acquisition of territory out of which new states might be carved at all events the mexicans felt so outraged at the terms proposed that they commenced preparations for defense without giving notice of the termination of the armistice the terms of the truce had been violated before when teams had been sent into the city to bring out supplies for the army the first train entering the city was very severely threatened by a mob this however was apologized for by the authorities and all responsibility for it denied and thereafter to avoid exciting the mexican people and soldiery our teams with their escorts were sent in at night when the troops were in barracks and the citizens in bed the circumstance was overlooked and negotiations continued as soon as the news reached general scott of the second violation of the armistice about the fourth of september he wrote a vigorous note to president santa anna calling his attention to it and receiving an unsatisfactory reply declared the armistice at an end general scott with worth's division was now occupying tacubaya a village some four miles southwest of the city of mexico and extending from the base up the mountain side for the distance of half a mile more than a mile west and also a little above the plain stands molino del rey the mill is a long stone structure one story high and several hundred feet in length at the period of which i speak general scott supposed a portion of the mill to be used as a foundry for the casting of guns this however proved to be a mistake it was valuable to the mexicans because of the quantity of grain it contained the building is flat roofed and a line of sandbags over the outer walls rendered the top quite a formidable defense for infantry Chapultepec is a mound springing up from the plain to the height of probably three hundred feet, and almost in a direct line between Molino del Rey and the western part of the city. It was fortified both on the top and on the rocky and precipitous sides. The city of Mexico is supplied with water by two aqueducts, resting on strong stone arches one of these aqueducts draws its supply of water from a mountain stream coming into it at or near molino del rey and runs north close to the west base of chapultepec thence along the center of a wide road until it reaches the road running east into the city by the garita san cosme from which point the aqueduct and road both run east to the city the second aqueduct starts from the east base of chapultepec where it is fed by a spring and runs northeast to the city this aqueduct like the other 
runs in the middle of a broad roadway thus leaving a space on each side the arches supporting the aqueduct afforded protection for advancing troops as well as to those engaged defensively at points on the san cosme road parapets were thrown across with an embrasure for a single piece of artillery in each at the point where both road and aqueduct turn at right angles from north to east there was not only one of these parapets supplied by one gun and infantry supports but the houses to the north of the san cosme road facing south and commanding a view of the road back to chapultepec were covered with infantry protected by parapets made of sandbags the roads leading to garitas the gates san cosme and balian by which these aqueducts enter the city were strongly entrenched deep wide ditches filled with water lined the sides of both roads such were the defenses of the city of mexico in september eighteen forty seven on the routes over which general scott entered prior to the mexican war general scott had been very partial to general worth indeed he continued so up to the close of hostilities but for some reason worth had become estranged from his chief scott evidently took this coldness somewhat to heart he did not retaliate however but on the contrary showed every disposition to appease his subordinate it was understood at the time that he gave worth authority to plan and execute the battle of molino del rey without dictation or interference from any one for the very purpose of restoring their former relations the effort failed and the two generals remained ever after cold and indifferent towards each other if not actually hostile the battle of molino del rey was fought on the eighth of september the night of the seventh worth sent for his brigade and regimental commanders with their staffs to come to his quarters to receive instructions for the morrow these orders contemplated a movement up to within striking distance of the mills before daylight the engineers had reconnoitred the ground as well as possible and had acquired all the information necessary to base proper orders both for approach and attack by daylight on the morning of the eighth the troops to be engaged at molino were all at the places designated the ground in front of the mills to the south was commanded by the artillery from the summit of chapultepec as well as by the lighter batteries at hand but a charge was made and soon all was over worth's troops entered the mills by every door and the enemy beat a hasty retreat back to chapultepec had this victory been followed up promptly no doubt americans and mexicans would have gone over the defenses of chapultepec so near together that the place would have fallen into our hands without further loss the defenders of the works could not have fired upon us without endangering their own men this was not done and five days later more valuable lives were sacrificed to carry works which had been so nearly in our possession on the eighth i do not criticize the failure to capture chapultepec at this time the result that followed the first assault could not possibly have been foreseen and to profit by the unexpected advantage the commanding general must have been on the spot and given the necessary instructions at the moment or the troops must have kept on without orders it is always however in order to follow a retreating foe unless stopped or otherwise directed the loss on our side at molino del rey was severe for the numbers engaged it was especially so among commissioned officers i was with the earliest of the troops to enter the mills in passing through to the north side looking towards chapultepec 
I happened to notice that there were armed Mexicans still on top of the building, only a few feet from many of our men. Not seeing any stairway or ladder reaching to the top of the building, I took a few soldiers and had a cart that happened to be standing near, brought up and placing the shafts against the wall and chalking the wheels so that the cart could not back, used the shafts as a sort of ladder extending to within three or four feet of the top. By this I climbed to the roof of the building, followed by a few men, but found a private soldier had preceded me by some other way. There were still quite a number of Mexicans on the roof, among them a major and five or six officers of lower grades, who had not succeeded in getting away before our troops occupied the building. They still had their arms, while the soldier before mentioned was walking as sentry, guarding the prisoners he had surrounded all by himself. I halted the sentinel, received the swords from the commissioned officers, and proceeded, with the assistance of the soldiers now with me, to disable the muskets by striking them against the edge of the wall and throw them to the ground below. Molino del Rey was now captured, and the troops engaged, with the exception of an appropriate guard over the captured position and property, were marched back to their quarters in Tacubaya. The engagement did not last many minutes but the killed and wounded were numerous for the number of troops engaged. During the night of the 11th, batteries were established which could play upon the fortifications of Chapultepec. The bombardment commenced early on the morning of the 12th, but there was no further engagement during this day than that of the artillery. General Scott assigned the capture of Chapultepec to General Pillow, but did not leave the details to his judgment. Two assaulting columns, 250 men each, composed of volunteers for the occasion, were formed. They were commanded by Captains Mackenzie and Casey, respectively. The assault was successful but bloody. In later years, if not at the time, the battles of Molino del Rey and Chapultepec have seemed to me to have been wholly unnecessary. When the assaults upon the Garitas of San Cosme and Balian were determined upon, the road running east to the former gate could have been reached easily without an engagement by moving along south of the mills until west of them sufficiently far to be out of range thence north to the road above mentioned, or, if desirable to keep the two attacking columns nearer together, the troops could have been turned east so as to come on the aqueduct road out of range of the guns from Chapultepec. In like manner, the troops designated to act against Baling could have kept east of Chapultepec out of range and come on to the aqueduct also out of range of Chapultepec. Molino del Rey and Chapultepec would both have been necessarily evacuated if this course had been pursued, for they would have been turned. General Quitman, a volunteer from the state of Mississippi, who stood well with the army both as a soldier and as a man, commanded the column acting against Balin. General Worth commanded the column against San Cosme. When Chapultepec fell, the advance commenced along the two aqueduct roads. I was on the road to San Cosme and witnessed most that took place on that route. When opposition was encountered, our troops sheltered themselves by keeping under the arches supporting the aqueduct advancing an arch at a time. We encountered no serious obstruction until within gunshot of the point where the road we were on intersects that running east to the city, the point where the aqueduct turns at a right angle. I have described the defenses of this position before. There were but three commissioned officers besides myself, 
that I can now call to mind with the advance when the above position was reached. One of these officers was a Lieutenant Sims of the Marine Corps. I think Captain Gore and Lieutenant Judah of the 4th Infantry were the others. Our progress was stopped for the time by the single piece of artillery at the angle of the roads and the infantry occupying the housetops back from it. West of the road, from where we were, stood a house occupying the southwest angle made by the San Cosme Road and the road we were moving upon. A stone wall ran from the house along each of these roads for a considerable distance and thence back until it joined, enclosing quite a yard about the house. I watched my opportunity and skipped across the road and behind the south wall. Proceeding cautiously to the west corner of the enclosure, I peeped around and, seeing nobody, continued still cautiously until the road running east and west was reached. I then returned to the troops and called for volunteers. All that were close to me, or that heard me, about a dozen, offered their services. Commanding them to carry their arms at a trail, I watched our opportunity and got them across the road and under cover of the wall beyond, before the enemy had a shot at us. Our men, under cover of the arches, kept a close watch on the entrenchments that crossed our path and the house tops beyond, and whenever a head showed itself above the parapets, they would fire at it. Our crossing was thus made practicable without loss. When we reached a safe position, I instructed my little command again to carry their arms at a trail, not to fire at the enemy until they were ordered, and to move very cautiously following me until the San Cosme road was reached. We would then be on the flank of the men serving the gun on the road, and with no obstruction between us and them. When we reached the southwest corner of the enclosure before described, I saw some United States troops pushing north through a shallow ditch nearby who had come up since my reconnaissance. This was the company of Captain Horace Brooks of the artillery acting as infantry. I explained to Brooks briefly what I had discovered and what I was about to do. He said, as I knew the ground and he did not, I might go on, and he would follow. As soon as we got on the road leading to the city, the troops serving the gun on the parapet retreated, and those on the housetops nearby followed. Our men went after them in such close pursuit, the troops we had left under the arches joining, that a second line across the road, about halfway between the first and the garita, was carried. No reinforcements had yet come up except Brooks's company, and the position we had taken was too advanced to be held by so small a force. It was given up, but retaken later in the day with some loss. Worth's command gradually advanced to the front, now open to it. Later in the day, in reconnoitering, I found a church off to the south of the road, which looked to me as if the belfry would command the ground back of the Garita San Cosme. I got an officer of the Votichers with a mountain howitzer and men to work it to go with me. The road being in possession of the enemy, we had to take the field to the south to reach the church. This took us over several ditches, breast deep in water and grown up with water plants. These ditches, however, were not over eight or ten feet in width. The howitzer was taken to pieces and carried by the men to its destination. When I knocked for admission, a priest came to the door who, while extremely polite, declined to admit us. With the little Spanish then at my command, I explained to him that he might save property by opening the door and he certainly would save himself from becoming a prisoner, for a time at least, and besides, I intended to go in whether he consented or not. He began to see his duty in the same light that I did, and opened the door, though 
he did not look as if it gave him special pleasure to do so. The gun was carried to the belfry and put together. We were not more than two or three hundred yards from San Cosme. The shots from our little gun dropped in upon the enemy and created great confusion. Why they did not send out a small party and capture us, I do not know. We had no infantry or other defenses besides our one gun. The effect of this gun upon the troops about the gate of the city was so marked that General Worth saw it from his position. He was so pleased that he sent a staff officer, Lieutenant Pemberton, later Lieutenant General, commanding the defenses of Vicksburg, to bring me to him. He expressed his gratification at the services the howitzer in the church steeple was doing, saying that every shot was effective, and ordered a captain of Votichers to report to me with another howitzer to be placed along with the one already rendering so much service. I could not tell the general that there was not room enough in the steeple for another gun, because he probably would have looked upon such a statement as a contradiction from a second lieutenant. I took the captain with me, but did not use his gun. The night of the 13th of September was spent by the troops under General Worth in the houses near San Cosme and in line confronting the general line of the enemy across to Belen. The troops that I was with were in the houses north of the road leading into the city and were engaged during the night in cutting passageways from one house to another towards the town. During the night, Santa Anna, with his army, except the deserters, left the city. He liberated all the convicts confined in the town, hoping, no doubt, that they would inflict upon us some injury before daylight. But several hours after Santa Anna was out of the way, the city authorities sent a delegation to General Scott to ask, if not demand, an armistice respecting church property, the rights of citizens, and the supremacy of the city government in the management of municipal affairs. General Scott declined to trammel himself with conditions but gave assurances that those who chose to remain within our lines would be protected so long as they behaved themselves properly. General Quitman had advanced along his line very successfully on the 13th, so that at night his command occupied nearly the same position at Balin that Worth's troops did about San Cosme. After the interview above related between General Scott and the city council, orders were issued for the cautious entry of both columns in the morning. The troops under Worth were to stop at the Alameda, a park near the west end of the city. Quitman was to go directly to the plaza and take possession of the palace, a mass of buildings on the east side in which Congress has its sessions, the national courts are held, the public offices are all located, the president resides, and much room is left for museums, receptions, etc. This is the building generally designated as the Halls of the Montezumas. End of section 11. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Little Rock, Arkansas, Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 12. Promotion to First Lieutenant. Capture of the City of Mexico. The Army. Mexican Soldiers. Peace Negotiations. On entering the city, 
the troops were fired upon by the released convicts and possibly by deserters and hostile citizens the streets were deserted and the place presented the appearance of a city of the dead except for this firing by unseen persons from housetops windows and around corners in this firing the lieutenant colonel of my regiment garland was badly wounded lieutenant sidney smith of the fourth infantry was also wounded mortally he died a few days after and by his death i was promoted to the grade of first lieutenant i had gone into the battle of palo alto in may eighteen forty six a second lieutenant and i entered the city of mexico sixteen months later with the same rank after having been in all the engagements possible for any one man and in a regiment that lost more officers during the war than it ever had present at any one engagement my regiment lost four commissioned officers all senior to me by steamboat explosions during the mexican war the mexicans were not so discriminating they sometimes picked off my juniors general scott soon followed the troops into the city in state i wonder that he was not fired upon but i believe he was not at all events he was not hurt he took quarters at first in the halls of the montezumas and from there issued his wise and discreet orders for the government of a conquered city and for suppressing the hostile acts of liberated convicts already spoken of orders which challenge the respect of all who study them lawlessness was soon suppressed and the city of mexico settled down into a quiet law-abiding place the people began to make their appearance upon the streets without fear of the invaders shortly afterwards the bulk of the troops were sent from the city to the villages at the foot of the mountains four or five miles to the south and southwest whether general scott approved of the mexican war and the manner in which it was brought about i have no means of knowing his orders to troops indicate only a soldierly spirit with probably a little regard for the perpetuation of his own fame on the other hand general taylor's i think indicate that he considered the administration accountable for the war and felt no responsibility resting on himself further than for the faithful performance of his duties both generals deserve the commendations of their countrymen and to live in the grateful memory of this people to the latest generation earlier in this narrative i have stated that the plain reached after passing the mountains east of perote extends to the cities of puebla and mexico the route traveled by the army before reaching puebla goes over a pass in a spur of mountain coming up from the south this pass is very susceptible of defense by a smaller against a larger force again the highest point of the roadbed between vera cruz and the city of mexico is over rio frio mountain which also might have been successfully defended by an inferior against a superior force but by moving north of the mountains and about thirty miles north of puebla both of these passes would have been avoided the road from perote to the city of mexico by this latter route is as level as the prairies in our west arriving due north from puebla troops could have been detached to take possession of that place and then proceeding west with the rest of the army no mountain would have been encountered before reaching the city of mexico it is true this road would have brought troops in by guadalupe a town church and detached spur of mountain about two miles north of the capital all bearing the same general name and at this point lake tezcoco comes near to the mountain which was fortified both at the base and on the sides but troops could have passed north of the mountain and come in only a few miles to the northwest 
and so flank the position as they actually did on the south it has always seemed to me that this northern route to the city of mexico would have been the better one to have taken but my later experience has taught me two lessons first that things are seen plainer after the events have occurred second that the most confident critics are generally those who know the least about the matter criticized i know just enough about the mexican war to approve heartily of most of the generalship but to differ with a little of it it is natural that an important city like puebla should not have been passed with contempt it may be natural that the direct road to it should have been taken but it could have been passed its evacuation insured and possession acquired without danger of encountering the enemy in intricate mountain defiles in this same way the city of mexico could have been approached without any danger of opposition except in the open field but general scott's successes are an answer to all criticism he invaded a populous country penetrating two hundred and sixty miles into the interior with a force at no time equal to one half of that opposed to him he was without a base the enemy was always entrenched always on the defensive yet he won every battle he captured the capital and conquered the government credit is due to the troops engaged it is true but the plans and the strategy were the generals i had now made marches and been in battle under both general scott and general taylor the former divided his force of ten thousand five hundred men into four columns starting a day apart in moving from puebla to the capital of the nation when it was known that an army more than twice as large as his own stood ready to resist his coming the road was broad and the country open except in crossing the rio frio mountain general taylor pursued the same course in marching toward an enemy he moved even in smaller bodies i never thought at the time to doubt the infallibility of these two generals in all matters pertaining to their profession i supposed they moved in small bodies because more men could not be passed over a single road on the same day with their artillery and necessary trains later i found the fallacy of this belief the rebellion which followed as a sequence to the mexican war never could have been suppressed if larger bodies of men could not have been moved at the same time than was the custom under scott and taylor the victories in mexico were in every instance over vastly superior numbers there were two reasons for this both general scott and general taylor had such armies as are not often got together at the battles of palo alto and resaca de la palma general taylor had a small army but it was composed exclusively of regular troops under the best of drill and discipline every officer from the highest to the lowest was educated in his profession not at west point necessarily but in the camp in garrison and many of them in indian wars the rank and file were probably inferior as material out of which to make an army to the volunteers that participated in all the later battles of the war but they were brave men and then drill and discipline brought out all there was in them a better army man for man probably never faced an enemy than the one commanded by general taylor in the earliest two engagements of the mexican war the volunteers who followed were of better material but without drill or discipline at the start they were associated with so many disciplined men and professionally educated officers that when they went into engagements it was with a confidence they would not have felt otherwise they became soldiers themselves almost at once all these conditions we would enjoy again in case of war 
the mexican army of that day was hardly an organization the private soldier was picked up from the lower class of the inhabitants when wanted his consent was not asked he was poorly clothed worse fed and seldom paid he was turned adrift when no longer wanted the officers of the lower grades were but little superior to the men with all this i have seen as brave stands made by some of these men as i have ever seen made by soldiers now mexico has a standing army larger than that of the united states they have a military school modeled after west point their officers are educated and no doubt generally brave the mexican war of eighteen forty six eighteen forty eight would be an impossibility in this generation the mexicans have shown a patriotism which it would be well if we would imitate in part but with more regard to truth they celebrate the anniversaries of chapultepec and molino del rey as of very great victories the anniversaries are recognized as national holidays at these two battles while the united states troops were victorious it was at very great sacrifice of life compared with what the mexicans suffered the mexicans as on many other occasions stood up as well as any troops ever did the trouble seemed to be the lack of experience among the officers which led them after a certain time to simply quit without being particularly whipped but because they had fought enough their authorities of the present day grow enthusiastic over their theme when telling of these victories and speak with pride of the large sum of money they forced us to pay in the end with us now twenty years after the close of the most stupendous war ever known we have writers who profess devotion to the nation engaged in trying to prove that the union forces were not victorious particularly they say we were slashed around from donelson to vicksburg and to chattanooga and in the east from gettysburg to appomattox when the physical rebellion gave out from sheer exhaustion there is no difference in the amount of romance in the two stories i would not have the anniversaries of our victory celebrated nor those of our defeats made fast days and spent in humiliation and prayer but i would like to see truthful history written such history will do full credit to the courage endurance and soldierly ability of the american citizen no matter what section of the country he hailed from or in what ranks he fought the justice of the cause which in the end prevailed will i doubt not come to be acknowledged by every citizen of the land in time for the present and so long as there are living witnesses of the great war of sections there will be people who will not be consoled for the loss of a cause which they believed to be holy as time passes people even of the south will begin to wonder how it was possible that their ancestors ever fought for or justified institutions which acknowledge the right of property in man after the fall of the capital and the dispersal of the government of mexico it looked very much as if military occupation of the country for a long time might be necessary general scott at once began the preparation of orders regulations and laws in view of this contingency he contemplated making the country pay all the expenses of the occupation without the army becoming a perceptible burden upon the people his plan was to levy a direct tax upon the separate states and collect at the ports left open to trade a duty on all imports from the beginning of the war private property had not been taken 
either for the use of the army or of individuals without full compensation this policy was to be pursued there were not troops enough in the valley of mexico to occupy many points but now that there was no organized army of the enemy of any size reinforcements could be got from the rio grande and there were also new volunteers arriving from time to time all by way of vera cruz military possession was taken of cornavaca fifty miles south of the city of mexico of toluca nearly as far west and of pachuca a mining town of great importance some sixty miles to the northeast vera cruz jalapa orizaba and puebla were already in our possession meanwhile the mexican government had departed in the person of santa anna and it looked doubtful for a time whether the united states commissioner mr trist would find anybody to negotiate with a temporary government however was soon established at queretaro and trist began negotiations for a conclusion of the war before terms were finally agreed upon he was ordered back to washington but general scott prevailed upon him to remain as an arrangement had been so nearly reached and the administration must approve his acts if he succeeded in making such a treaty as had been contemplated in his instructions the treaty was finally signed the second of february eighteen forty eight and accepted by the government at washington it is that known as the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo and secured to the united states the rio grande as the boundary of texas and the whole territory then included in new mexico and upper california for the sum of fifteen million dollars soon after entering the city of mexico the opposition of generals pillow worth and colonel duncan to general scott became very marked scott claimed that they had demanded of the president his removal i do not know whether this is so or not but i do know of their unconcealed hostility to their chief at last he placed them in arrest and preferred charges against them of insubordination and disrespect this act brought on a crisis in the career of the general commanding he had asserted from the beginning that the administration was hostile to him that it had failed in its promises of men and war material that the president himself had shown duplicity if not treachery in the endeavor to procure the appointment of benton and the administration now gave open evidence of its enmity about the middle of february orders came convening a court of inquiry composed of brevet brigadier general towson and the paymaster general of the army brigadier general cushing and colonel belknap to inquire into the conduct of the accused and the accuser and shortly afterwards orders were received from washington relieving scott of the command of the army in the field and assigning major-general william o butler of kentucky to the place this order also released pillow worth and duncan from arrest if a change was to be made the selection of general butler was agreeable to every one concerned so far as i remember to have heard expressions on the subject there were many who regarded the treatment of general scott as harsh and unjust it is quite possible that the vanity of the general had led him to say and do things that afforded a plausible pretext to the administration for doing just what it did and what it had wanted to do from the start the court tried the accuser quite as much as the accused it was adjourned before completing its labors to meet in frederick maryland general scott left the country and never after had more than the nominal command of the army until early in eighteen sixty one he certainly was not sustained in his efforts to maintain discipline 
in high places the efforts to kill off politically the two successful generals made them both candidates for the presidency general taylor was nominated in eighteen forty eight and was elected four years later general scott received the nomination but was badly beaten and the party nominating him died with his defeat end of section twelve recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com